been thinking about time, long, slow time, not just a late spring afternoon lying next to a forest pond in the warm sun, listening to the singing of one tiny yellow warbler perched near the top of a willow, and to the small noises in the underbrush, the chatter and rustling of those tiny ones who call the forest floor their home, and not just the long, slow time of a childhood summer day that lasts a thousand years. It's time enough to watch dust motes dance in the sunlight. Time enough to get bored and then to fall through that boredom into creativity and then to make one's way back to boredom and then again to creativity. And still is never quite long enough. I'm thinking about long, slow time, days, months, years, centuries, millennia, long, slow time. I was thinking about that because I was writing a, a preface to a book and, and I decided that, the, the, that I didn't really need to write that part of the preface and so that's not gonna get published, that, that part's not gonna get published. But I was thinking about it because in the, in the preface, there was a discussion of how we live in a time of sound bites and how real discourse and real thinking takes long, slow time and it takes years to, to ruminate and to, to decolonize and to to change how you think and to, and real thinking takes long, slow time. And then I was thinking about a conversation I had with a friend of mine who's a fisheries biologist. We were sitting by the ocean and, well, two things. One is that uh, he, he said, wouldn't it be interesting to, to live like fish in a three-dimensional world, like fish and birds. I just looked at him and I said, we live in a three-dimensional world. You know, we go up hills and down hills. He said, no, you're still effectively on a plane and the plane is moving up and down. You, you, we, we really, as all uh, earth-based creatures, by which I mean not air-based and not ocean-based or fish-based or water-based, we live really in two dimensions. And that it can, that dimension can fold, but it's still, you're fundamentally, even if you're going up a hill, you're still six feet from the ground or five feet from the ground, as opposed to fish can truly move in three dimensions and birds can truly move in three dimensions. So there's one thing he said. And then, and then he, he also said to me, and then that's blew me up, blew me away. And I've been, it's probably six months ago and I'm still sort of ramifying with the, the effects of understanding that. And the, the second thing he said was that um, sharks, have rough skin and this rough skin allows them to swim much faster than if they had smooth skin and this once again delighted me as i am so often delighted when i find out about how extraordinarily smart and complex the real world is it's just there are these problems that the natural world has come up with these wonderful solutions to. And so I, I said to him that, you know, nature just seems so very, very intelligent. And I, I, I know that he goes to, to church every week. And, and so I said, do you, do you believe in a God? Do you believe in some sort of creator who made all of this? And he said, I don't believe in, in a God as such. I just go to church to go to church. And I said, well, where does the intelligence come from? And it doesn't have to be external. I mean, the, the intelligence can be in the trees themselves. And he had this, this great line, which once again, I'm still trying to understand, which is there is great intelligence in time. And one of the things he meant about that is if you have a problem, how can, I, how can this fish go faster? Then if you have a lot of time, nature will work out the solution to it. And I think that that's 
a really wonderful model all the way around. And, and this takes me back to what the preface was about. And the preface was about, it was about a bunch of other things too, but part of what the preface was about was, was that when we deprive ourselves of the long form thinking that we talked about in a previous video, when we deprive ourselves of this long form thinking, our ability to provide substantive answers to, to, to difficult problems is short circuited. That real, real solutions to real problems take a lot of time. And there's one other thing I, I guess I wanna mention about this, which is that that preface is to a book that, that I co-wrote with someone and the book was written in the form of letters to each other. And one of the things that was really interesting to me was that every time I would receive a letter, I would think, oh my gosh, how can I possibly, how can I possibly respond to this? This is, this is really good stuff. I don't know how to, 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 I don't know what I can write that will be worthy of, of response to what I just got. And the whole book was written that way. And the person I was writing it with said she felt the same. And it was, we never tried to, you know, she would write a letter and I would never try to win. I would never try to say, oh, I'm right and you're wrong and I'm going to show you how mine is better. Instead, I kept thinking as we were writing a, but about two things. One is, is a dance, which I, you know, that one person would make a move and the other person would respond to it. But the, the, the other thing I was thinking of even more is I was thinking of evolution and I was thinking back to what my friend was saying about the sharks being so fast. And I was thinking about how we so often misperceive almost everything. And one of the things that we misperceive is the relationship between different species. We think that they're always in competition. And so if it's in competition, if this, comp if this book were written as competition, then I would have been trying to beat her and she would have been trying to beat me. But instead, each of us was trying to, she would write something and it would be good enough that it would force me to up my game. And then she said that when she would get my letter back, she would think the same thing I did. It's like, how can I possibly respond to this? I want to force her to up her game. And this all made me think about how, about something Paul Shepard talked about, about how wolves and deer are not in an arms race. That's how so many people in this culture would put it, that it's a big arms race, each one trying to conquer the other. But instead, that's not it at all. What's happening is over time, the deer help the wolves to become faster because if the wolves aren't fast enough, they won't be fed. And the wolves make the deer faster over time by pushing the deer, that if the deer aren't fast enough, they won't survive. And so instead of perceiving it as an arms race, you perceive it as this long-term dance where each is honing the other's skills. And it's the same, I believe that that's how discourse should be. That what we should be is we should be participating in this long-term dance with each other where each one of us is not trying to show up the other, not trying to pick one little thing to get at and to exploit, but instead, to each one is helping to hone the other's arguments. And each one is doing that by putting forth the best arguments they can and by putting forth the best thoughts they can. And then the other person ruminates and the other person takes the time to respond. And, you know, one last thing is, is I remember talking to Vine DeLorean. He, he was talking about how we at different times of our life, we have different roles that we play and different, different things to do. And that one of the purposes of old age is to, you have the time to 
ruminate and the time to to reflect on the patterns that you have experienced in your lifetime and you have the time to try to start seeing how things all fit together and it seems to me that that is one of the gifts of time long slow time is the the ability to the, you have participated in enough patterns and you have witnessed and experienced enough patterns at that point you can begin to see them and that takes the time to have experienced them and it takes the time to have reflected upon them and i guess one last thing and this comes from a a novel i read when i was a teenager it was um the Mary Stewart trilogy, the Merlin trilogy by Mary Stewart. And there was this one line about the God will not speak to those who have no time to listen. And I've said several times, I'm gonna, this will be the final thing, but now this will be the final thing that, you know, as a writer, I'm, I'm very prolific. I've written 20 some books in the last 20 years. And the truth is that I waste prodigious amounts of time and I, spend lots of time doing nothing and um, taking walks. And it's not really doing nothing. It's, I've used the word ruminate several times and that comes from rumen. That comes from what cows do. They eat something and then they swallow it and they bring it back up and they chew it again and then they swallow it and they let the, microbes in their guts do their work and then they bring it back up and then they swallow it and that's what i think we have to do and that's what that requires long slow time and so i will do nothing and i will do nothing and then i will do nothing and then all of a sudden i'll write three pages and then i'll do nothing and nothing and i think for me that's one of the things that we're missing in this modern culture the other night the uh, electricity went out in a big windstorm and it got dark about 8 and so I went to bed about 8 15 I'm usually up working till 2 in the morning I went to bed about 8 15 and it was so nice to just lie there with my eyes closed for hours and just drift and in fact, what I read at the beginning came while I was lying there drifting. Frankly, half of my books have been written with me lying in bed with my eyes closed. And then there'll be some glimmer of a sentence. And then it'll come closer and then it'll go away and then it'll come closer. And maybe 15 minutes later, it might develop into a sentence and then it might develop into two and then it might develop into three a half hour later and then i turn on the light I couldn't that night because the electricity was off but on a normal night i would turn on the light and start writing and i think that this is one of the many things that we are losing in this sort of modern fast paced world is the capacity and the willingness to lie there and be bored and to ruminate and to take the time to actually listen.